yeah, I want to echo what um, Emily said earlier. Uh, this has been really a great session, even though it's vir virtual. And um, and I really appreciate all the effort that's gone into um, to making this work. Uh, largely, I think that's all of us coming together. So everybody, thank you for your time. Um, and on top of that, uh, I, I too am just always impressed by everything going on across the network. Um, a couple of things um, that we've been working on. So some news from us. <clears throat> um, we had our site review in January 2020. The team actually made it down to the ice on time. Um, the weather was fairly good. Uh, don't ask any of them about getting home because that was a bit of a nightmare, but uh, but they did make it off the continent safely. Uh, and then there was like a, a quite a gap before the rest of us did. Um, one other thing I, that I don't recall Emily mentioning, um, there was a Chapman conference uh, back in uh, October 2019 that focused on uh, winter limnology um, and that included several folks from both uh, McMurdo LTER and, and um, uh, North Temperate Lakes um, and I think there's going to be a special issue of JGR Biogeosciences coming together um, this fall so uh, if you're looking forward if you if you're looking for an outlet for a, a winter limnology paper um, please feel free to contact uh, Emily or me and we can put you in contact with the right folks for that special issue. Um, one of the things that we've been focusing on, though, is connectivity. And I wanted to take a break from that a little bit. I'm going to start with that context and talk about um, some of our evolution in thinking a little bit about how our system works. Um, and so we have these, these glaciers, uh, lakes, streams, um, and, and soils that we study. And we are often thinking about those connections through time. And so our streams um, flow for about three to seven or eight weeks per year. Um, and they're, they're completely filled with, um, with meltwater that comes off of the glaciers. So this is all very much driven by energy balance. Um, on the right, you can see um, some of our benthic algal mats that are being sampled in, in this um, context. And so we, we can often think about you know, the connection of both mass and, uh, and energy moving from glaciers um, down to the lakes. And these lakes, by the way, are also closed basin. Um, and so they rise and fall with the uh, input and, and removal of water and, and mass. Um, <clears throat> the other connection though that we think about, so, so from a hydrologic perspective, the connectivity is very short window of the year, um, but throughout the year, we also have these phone wind events, somewhat like catabatics, large wind events that blow down through the valleys and move a lot of sediment around. So this is another version of that, or, or uh, we don't have a good visual of wind moving things around, but this is the result. Um, this is the a permanent lake ice cover with um, fresh sediment from over the, the previous winter. And um, these lake uh, ice thicknesses are three to five meters thick, but these form, you know, these, these block uh, par from coming through and so forth. And, and so we've been thinking a lot about these connections through time and space. Um, however, um, by default, we have become uh, fair weather researchers uh, in Antarctica. And that's partly driven by um, the US Antarctic program and the season that, that they support. So um, on the left, what you see is uh, the 30 year averages of daily uh, radiation, solar radiation and um, air temperatures that have been measured at one of our uh, longest standing uh, uh, meteorological stations. And, and I've focused this on the summer, right? Summer is in the middle and so when it gets warm, um, uh, that's when we tend to go out there. When it's cold, huh, don't know what happened to my animations. Anyway, um, there was supposed to be a box here showing that we arrive in, um, in October and then we have to leave the field by late January and we miss potentially a lot of action, a lot of, of biology that's occurring uh, later in the season. Well, now I'm missing everything. All right, let's try this. Um, oh, there's my animations. All right, so there's the, there's the general field season. Um, but we think that from our sensors that we leave out, we expect that there are um, a lot of things going on in sort of the shoulder season as we move into the winter. Now, our streams shut down, the soils freeze. Um, and so by the time we get to sort of June, July, of course, it's probably too, too cold for a lot of uh, action to be occurring, except in the lake water columns. So let's shift to that for just a moment. Um, if we look in the, the, our long-term data here, this is from a recent paper we had sort of synthesizing what, what, uh, how our system has responded to this flood year that occurred in January 2002. One of the things that we see is we had this decline in, in 
um, primary productivity in two different lake basins. These happen to be um, connected to each other. Uh, it is one single closed basin lake, but they have two basins to them. Um, and so we see that decrease through time until about 2002. And then we saw this sort of not really a warming trend, but we weren't cooling anymore. And we started to have this uptick in um, lake primary productivity in one of these two basins that was evident through 2013. And so um, what's, you know, what's useful from that is we can say, oh, look at, look at what's going on with primary producti productivity, but we're really only looking at that through the summer, okay, which is, of course, the time when there's plenty of light and we expect most biological activity to, to be occurring. But the challenge is, you know, we don't really know what's going on in the winter. So we don't, when it comes to things like carbon cycling or um, any other nutrient cycling, <clears throat> we don't really have a good sense of what happens beyond the time we leave the, the, the field. Now, we do have a number of sensors out there, and I'll talk about some improvements we've made recently, but it's really difficult to get after some of these processes um, when we're not there. So um, one thing that, that John Priskew has been making these measurements uh, for 30 years now likes to, to throw out there is, you know, could you balance your checkbook with only half of the info? Um, for those of you who have joint checking accounts, maybe you go through this anyway. But, you know, regardless, we're, if we're trying to come up with sort of what happens on a, on, on a basis of, of thinking about carbon as a currency in these lakes, it's a little difficult when we can't go and make PPR measurements through the winter. Now, one of the things that we have done, though, um, in uh, about 2010 or so, uh, part of our group was funded by NASA to um, uh, to buy some new equipment to basically create these nice profilers that would go under the lake ice. So on the left, you can see all this fancy hardware. I'm only going to go through a little part of this since this is supposed to be a, a quick talk. And um, what I want to point out is, is this is the chlorophyll trace from the west lobe of Lake Bonnie. Again, this, this two um, double basin, um, closed, closed basin lake. And um, what you see now, winter is moved to the center of this, okay? So we start in December, which is the austral summer. We go through June, July when it's dark, and we move back into September as we go through this graph from left to right. And there's this really nice chlorophyll peak. And the, the range that you can see, that standard deviation that's noted, is because it is profiling. So this is a mean of a profile. And I'll show you on the next slide. This is, of course, this chlorophyll is made up of lots of different um, potential components here, right? So we've got brown and mixed algae. This is from a fluorometer uh, from daily measurements um, as we profile from 15 meters down to 21 meters depth. And this is um, just uh, around the chemocline um, where we tend to have a, a bit of a chlorophyll maximum. And so what we see then is these are the, the this heat map then. Um, and by the way, I'm gonna show you two more of these on the next slide. Just note that the, um, the scales are changing. So this is zero to about um, nine, almost 10 uh, milligram, or micrograms of, of chlorophyll A per liter uh, on, for the, the top one. And then panel B is just zero to eight. So um, just keep, keep an eye on that. But you can see that, for example, the green algae seems to almost disappear by the time the light comes back in, in August, September, um, whereas the, the brown and mixed algae seem to take off in the dark. Uh, when we shift to um, the cryptophytes and cyanobacteria, we see a different story there as well. So um, I, I recognize that these aren't always perfect because we're using a floral probe to do this, but we do also have um, one thing that I, I'm not going to have time to show you is the, um, the, the uh, genetics data that we have from this as well. But this is coming together in a paper that um, we're trying to get into um, limnology and oceanography for review. But the idea here is that we are seeing these community changes and we don't quite know what the functional change is then in processes during this dark time. Now, one thing I'll also note is John has come down early in August, what we call wind fly, to um, look at what happens when the sun rises and how these systems work. And he, in 2007-8, during the uh, international uh, polar year, he was able to stay late too. He had a grant that kept him in the field until about March, April. Um, now that was all focused on the lakes, but he gave us some anecdotes about what happens in the um, the soils and the streams. He saw the streams shut down. He saw the soils become very wet for a prolonged period of time. These are things we've never seen because we've never been in the field late enough to see those. So one of the questions we currently have is what happens in these other habitats? How do, what happens when streams shut down? What, you know, how much carbon cycling is occurring after we leave? Um, what are the mats doing to sort of preserve themselves? And when, when it comes to, this is a, on the right-hand side, this is a little bit of a, um, 
easy uh, example of this, the soils, but the, we see these wetted rings around streams and lakes often with the soils. But, but you know, you could imagine that sort of wetted um, sort of perimeter expanding out further across the landscape, uh, perhaps due to deliquescence of the deposition of atmospheric moisture um, due to salts in the soils. Um, how do the soil organisms respond to that? And what does that mean then for restarting the next year? All right, so where are we gonna go next? I think um, this has been a little bit of food for thought for thinking about McMurdo 6, but to prepare for that, so you know, thinking about having a partial focus on late seasons, this, there's, there's a lot of um, uh, logistics that would have to, that would be required to support any work beyond sort of the typical season. So uh, it's not exactly certain how that would occur, but maybe one or two out of a six year grant cycle might happen. Um, but we're excited to explore these potential um, stream and soil communities really during this, this uh, shoulder season, as somebody mentioned yesterday, thinking a little bit about sh shoulder seasons, how much, um, you know, uh, nutrient cycling occurs during these times. Um, what is, uh, how important is winter or the transition maybe just through fall and, and during these times? And one of the things that, that um, I was actually kind of came to my own conclusion about this, I know that Peter Groffman would probably like to tell us about how important um, uh, uh, nitrogen mineralization under the snowpack is, um, which is something we've, uh, uh, that was, there's some really nice work done at Niwot Ridge on that back in the day. Um, but how important is winter to your ecosystem and how might that parallel with ours? Not unlike Morea though, we are facing some challenges. Um, we learned from NSF the other day that uh, we need to think carefully about not having 31 people go to the ice this year, but maybe three, maybe six, maybe seven, a very small skeleton crew um, and they would not be coming in and out of the field. Um, there's a lot of concern about uh, vectors of, of infection and so forth and, and, and passing the virus around. So we are um, trying to think carefully about what we can get done, but it's probably gonna be a very curtailed season. So with that, I'll end and uh, thank you for your attention.